And our final speaker of the third technical session is John Smith, who's also a student at the University of Maryland. Testing, testing, all right, everybody hear me? Hi, so my name is John Schmidt and my project is titled Obstacle Avoidance on a Variable Sweep Wing UAV. I worked on this project along with Aditi Remedwar and Graham Boucheri under Dr. Mumu Shu, as well as with Frank Ciancierulo under Dr. Norman Worley and we were supervised by Dr. Todd Henry from the Army Research Labs. So I'll go off with a overview of how I'm gonna go about presenting this. Uh, we're going to begin with an introduction talking about what exactly we are doing in this project and why before I move on to a high level approach discussing what has been done in the past and how this project differs from all that. And then finally moving on to the finer details showing the work that has been done in the past year and ended off with a summary recap. So starting with an introduction, uh, what exactly are we doing? So some background information. You have small UAVs in the quadcopter category that could stop and turn on a dime to avoid obstacles. So we have people flying these drones around uh, neighborhoods, parks, and they could avoid almost anything. And we want to try to extend this agility to fixed wing UAVs, allowing them to maneuver in spaces that they previously couldn't. And we want to do this by the means of retracting the wings of the airplane backwards. So imagine the airplane is just... <laughs> All right. So yeah, that pretty much explains how we want to do that. And in particular, we want to avoid obstacles that are reminiscent of tree branch-like structures that you would find while flying in a wooded area. This project was tasked by the Army Research Labs as part of their development of an impact-resistant variable sweep wing UAV. And on the UMD side, we have an emphasis on the active obstacle avoidance. So this is avoiding collision at all costs. And in the bottom left, you can see a figure of an F-14 Tomcat demonstrating that sweeping wing capability. And on the bottom right, we have an image, some motivation from nature showing that this has been done in the past. Although birds don't have fixed wings, you can imagine that we're trying to go for the same ability, flying through gaps in tree branches. So moving on to the high level approach, what has been done in the past and how is our project different from that? Well, a lot has actually been done in the past in terms of obstacle avoidance on UAVs. And many of these previous projects have taken advantage of systems such as monocular and stereo vision, LIDAR, motion capture, among other things, in order to detect and avoid their obstacles. So far, the state of the art comes from a paper from MIT where they have a fixed wing obstacle avoidance algorithm avoiding tree branches at 31 miles an hour with a novel form of stereo vision. So you might be wondering, how does our project fit into all this if so much has already been done? Well, for one, the platform that we're using is entirely different. So the E-Flight V900 is a stock RC airplane that comes ready to fly, and it could reach speeds of over 100 miles an hour, which is about three times faster than the state of the art. So on the bottom left, you can see how sleek this airplane actually is. It's almost no room to add additional equipment. And then the bottom right, see if we get this video to show exactly how fast it takes off. And it's right around 30 to 40 miles an hour. We tested it with the pitot static system. And you can see it just zooms out of the frame of the camera. The pilot has a pretty good eye in order to land that. All right, so what else is different this time around? Our means of obstacle avoidance. So usually when you're avoiding an obstacle, you see it, you want to avoid it at all costs. And that could be done by going around, turning around. But what's different this time is that we actually have the means to go through the obstacle, going through gaps. And this is done with additional hardware that is going to be sweeping the wing backwards. So some pseudocode showing like, the very simple ideas of how we're going to go about doing this is that while the airplane is flying and seeing an obstacle, if it sees an obstacle that's too small of a gap to fly through, it'll just go around. But if the airplane sees an obstacle with a gap that it could squeeze its wings through, it'll decide to retract its wings and go through. So on a high level approach, this seems pretty simple things start to get tricky when you actually try to implement it in hardware. So we're going to move on to the finer details of this project, beginning with the hardware side. So graduate student Frank Ciancierulo developed an actual sweeping wing mechanism specifically for the V900. And here's the video showing how that works. It's digitally controlled and it uses something called a pneumatic artificial muscle that retracts the wing backwards and 
once the wings are fully retracted, uh, the muscle relaxes and a spring restores the wings to their original position. With all this additional hardware and with the speeds that the hardware can actually go at since it can't activate instantaneously, we have a new weight and timing constraint on the obstacle avoidance algorithm and on the platform itself. So more details on the platform, a system diagram, it's a little hard to see everything, but I'll try to explain some of the most important parts that go into this airplane. So a GPS and airspeed sensor are required to find out the position and velocity of the aircraft. A camera is used to detect the obstacle and a flight controller is used to take that information and along with the, the code that's running on it that runs the obstacle avoidance and detection algorithms creates a trajectory for the airplane to keep flying. And then it sends that information back to a ground control system via telemetry radio and it also controls the actual actuators such as ailerons, rudder, thrust, and the sweeping wing mechanism itself to make that airplane react in time. So here's that system diagram actually shown in real life. We have all the equipment in there minus the sweeping wing mechanism. So there's a battery, there's a receiver, telemetry radio, GPS, pedostatic system, and I, I believe that's all. But you can see it's really jam-packed in there, not much room for anything else. And we even had to modify the canopy in order to get the GPS to fit on that. So coming back to the weight constraint. The unmodified V900 itself with the battery comes in just under three pounds, but weight estimates from Frank puts the PAM and connecting hardware on the platform at well over seven pounds. And this is twice the weight of the aircraft. And this isn't considering the weight of all that previous equipment to make the airplane autonomous that was shown in the last couple of slides. So we have a major weight constraint in order to try to alleviate uh, concerns related with flight testing we're opting for a different route. So we are trying hardware in the loop benchtop testing where we keep the airplane on, on the ground, not in the air, and take the propeller off, but still allow it to react to footage. So we're gonna take pre-recorded footage of flying toward an obstacle and feed it into the V900 platform to see how it will react. And we don't have to worry about crashes and repairs, which could be costly in both terms of money and time. So moving on to the obstacle detection and avoidance side of things. Uh, before we avoid an obstacle, we actually have to detect it. But I haven't exactly defined what our obstacle really is. I've said before that it's reminiscent to tree branch-like structures and the gaps between them. But in reality, we want to be able to fly through anything that has a gap large enough that could be flown through. So this could be tree branches, windows, flagpoles. And in order to try to make the problem more tractable, simplify it down to its basic building blocks, we are limiting ourselves to virtual vertical poles. So imagine just two poles side by side with a gap between them that the aircraft could fly in between. This allows for straight and level flight into the obstacle at any altitude, given that there's enough height left that when the airplane retracts its wings, it won't droop into the ground. And this is this sweep induced droop is just caused by the loss of lift when the wing area You? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, hardware issues. <laughs> so when, when the wings actually retract backwards, you lose some of that wing area, and then you lose lift. So that's another issue. But in this bench top testing, we don't have to worry about that. Going around the obstacles is also reduced to straight and level turns. So as long as the airplane is coordinated, we don't have to worry about losing altitude when we're going around obstacles. And another benefit of using this simplified version of an obstacle is that these poles could be represented as a single point in space. Once you identify one point where your obstacle is, then you can extend it infinitely above and below in the height direction in order to find that pole. In order to do this, we are going to be using Aruco tags to represent our obstacle so that we could define this one point in space that could be detected. And eventually, we want to extend this to actual branch gap detection. But for the moment, we're sticking with the Ruko tags just to demonstrate that some sort of obstacle be, can be detected. So some more details on this Ruko tag detection. They look like QR codes. The, the camera takes an image, a video in this case, and we can see that multiple tags are detected. 
once at least one tag is detected, you could get its position and orientation with respect to the camera. And then going through some transformation matrices, you can find the position of the tag with respect, or you can find the yeah, position of the tag with respect to the aircraft and hence in the global coordinate system. And once you have that, you could plot the obstacle in the coordinate system too. And adding in the aircraft, you could see that if we only have one tag, we could just define this gap such that the vertical pole extending from the midpoint of one Q or from one April, I'm sorry, one Aruko tag is created such that the second virtual pole creates a line segment that's perpendicular to the flight path of the aircraft. So the main point of this is that we only need one tag to create our virtual obstacle. Here's just showing that the tag detection algorithm in action. It uses OpenCV2 libraries and it's pretty fast. It operates in real time. So moving on to the timing constraint. So the hardware itself for retracting the wings put an estimate right around half second but in reality, we think we could speed this up a lot, but still be on the order of about a tenth of a second. But just stick with the half second for now. And then moving, or assuming that the V900 itself flies at around 60 miles per hour in cruise, this comes from some flight tests and videos of people finding the top speed anywhere between 30 to 100 plus miles an hour. I think 60 is a pretty good estimate. This gives us a minimum reaction distance of 44 feet. So that means if the aircraft is flying at an obstacle. It has to see the obstacle 44 feet ahead of time before it can react, otherwise it'll collide. And a problem with our tag detection algorithm is that it can only detect really small tags at a really small distance. So we have to scale them up. And for 44 feet, the smallest tag we detect is two and a half by two and a half feet. So we made one. And here is showing that the tag detection algorithm in action with this humongous tag that we spliced together from multiple sheets of paper. And it works. We tested it on, a, on an electric skateboard to try to simulate the straight and level flight. And now we have these videos that we could actually feed into the benchtop V900. So the last few steps is to actually implement everything together. The pneumatic actuated muscle, V900, and the obstacle avoidance and detection algorithms. There's still a few more steps required to make this complete, but one of the things is that we have to make sure that the airplane believes it's flying when it's not. And this will be done by using software such as Mission Planner and we'll have the airplane believe it's flying a rectangular pattern until it spots the obstacle, at which point it follows through its obstacle avoidance algorithm. And this will require dynamic waypoint plotting. I'll show an image on the next slide showing how this exactly works, but it's basically the same thing from the pseudocode from the first few slides. Still a work in progress, but this is really close and the pieces are all there and it's coming together. So here is the obstacle avoidance algorithm shown in Mission Planner. The airplane is flying its rectangular course, four waypoints are plotted. It sees an obstacle and the gap is too small. So what it does, it plots a waypoint, it creates a new trajectory, it goes around it and it gets back on trajectory. But if the gap is large enough, it retract its wings, fly through and that's what we want to demonstrate. So we want to see this aircraft reacting in real time while it's on the table, showing its wings retract backwards, ailerons moving, all that. And in summary, overall goal is showing that the aircraft can autonomously detect and avoid obstacles by swooping its back, wings backwards. We came across some constraints from the weight on the aircraft and from the high-speed nature of the platform. And we tried to make the problem more tractable by moving toward benchtop testing and using Aruko tag detection. Future considerations would include making a custom platform that would allow for true flight tests, at a safer expense, true safer flight tests, so we don't have to worry about crashes as often, and also moving away from Aruko tag detection towards true true branch like detection. And that's all I have. Any questions? Questions for the speaker? Yeah, so the... So we
uh, it's on and off I so. Curious. I think that we've done a number on the batteries. Uh, okay. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So the wing sweep angle itself, it goes back about 45 degrees. It's already at a fixed sweep beforehand. That's not a true zero to 45, but I don't have the exact specifications off the top of my head right now. And I do believe the wingspan somewhere around, what is this, like 1.2 meters? I think that's what it is. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Other questions for the speaker? So I have a question, which is the, um, the muscle. Yeah. How, how do you expect that to affect the, the dynamics of the aircraft? Like when it, the muscle is actually tightening up or, or, or loosening, is, is that Are you talking to have like in a terms effect? of reaction forces or in terms of the actual dynamics of the aircraft and the fact that the geometry of the wings are changing? Uh, so there's kind of two things. And I guess like I infer that your assumption is that, that the wings changing is going to be a much larger effect than like the weight change uh, due to the fact that the muscle is moving around, but, but that's just my, my inference and I have no idea if that's correct. Is that, yeah, so can you speak to that? I could speak to the weight change first. So we try to weight and balance the aircraft such that we don't have to worry about those reaction impulses. But in terms of the actual geometry changes of the wing sweep, I did some work about a year ago trying to figure out how much this actually affects the aircraft. And it's shown that at, well, let me put this in a better perspective. For varying degrees of wing sweep, the, the wings actually lose some area. And at 90 degrees of wing sweep, you're basically a flying body with no wings at all. And at that point, you're just gonna fall to the ground. And we found that at 45 degrees with a suitable uh, control algorithm that uses both thrust and elevator control, you could get the airplane back onto trajectory within two seconds, given that the full retract and then sweep back forward takes about one second. So it's manageable as long as you have two seconds of time to recover and you don't hit the ground in two seconds. So you don't want to fly low. Okay, thank you very much. We have one more question. So the uh, given wing position is, I'm assuming, like three different variables, right, for at the given state for the wing uh, position. And then is that based on the speed of the, you know, of the, of the device, or is it based on something else? Are, are you asking if the position of, or, or the degree of sweep of the wing is dependent on the speed of the aircraft? Right, is it, is it totally dependent on the speed or, is it, or are there other variables? The, the degree of sweep of the wings is dependent only on the detection of the obstacle. So as long as we see an obstacle ahead of us and we decide that we could fit through the gap, then it will go back all the way. So it's a zero to 100 process, no in between. Okay. Yeah. So when the, when the wing is fully back, then it's essentially in a glide mode. Like it yeah, basically. There's no drag, there's no anything, it's just... The you know. only control inputs you have at that point are putting the wings back to normal, which you don't want to do until once you clear the obstacle. And then you have thrust and elevator control. And with those that I was talking about earlier, you could still guide the aircraft back to position during that wing bring forward process, but it takes about two seconds. Very nice. Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time.